Today we will solve differentiation problems. The first problem is the derivative of x squared. It's easy. The answer is 2x. Now the next problem is... Whoa, what is it? What happened? By the way, where is this? You are finally here. That voice, you are Mazin? This is the place of beginning. I guess you are influenced by something. Is there something troubling you? Oh, that's right. A strange problem suddenly appeared. What is the square root symbol attached to d by dx? Okay, I know what's going on. What? What do you mean? This is probably the symbol for half derivatives. Half derivatives? Yes, it means to differentiate only half. We can also call them one half derivatives. Differentiate only half? Does it mean to stop the differentiation halfway? I don't really understand. I've only heard about the existence of half derivatives through rumors. Hi, is that so? Let's think about it together. Okay. In order to understand half derivatives, let's first review second order derivatives. Oh, I also know that. The second derivative means a function differentiated twice. Yes. The second derivative of a function f of x is expressed like this. And this is the derivative of the derivative. Yeah, that's true. Well, it is not wrong to write the second derivative in this way. It is a slightly minor notation. When considering half derivatives, this notation seems easier for me to explain, so I will use this notation this time. I allow it. Based on this idea, let's think about one half derivatives. Or half derivatives? I'm not used to hearing that. I'm also using it for the first time. First of all, the problem was something called the square root of d by dx. Oh yeah, that's it! The square root can also be expressed as the one half power, so you can write it this way. Just so you know, regarding this, the general notation looks like this, so please take note. I understand. Speaking of which, this is like a symbol that replaces 2 in the second derivative with 1 half. That's right. What kind of properties do you want the square root of d by dx to satisfy? Ah, uh, I don't know. So what does square root mean? It's something that when squared becomes that number. Oh, I got it. If something called the square root of d by dx exists, we want the square root of d by dx to be squared to become d by dx. Yes, this is exactly the property we want for the square root of d by dx. In other words, if we apply the square root of d by dx to f of x twice, we get the same result as differentiating f of x. Let's build such kind of the square root of d by dx. We're about to build something amazing, but does such a thing really exist? Honestly, I don't know, but we might be able to add some meaning to this expression. So let's try it anyway. Got it! For now, let's consider the usual nth derivative. Why do we consider the nth derivative? There may be some hidden hints about half derivatives. Oh yeah. I don't know much about it, but I'll give it a try anyway. For now, let a be a natural number. The derivative of x to the a is ax to the a minus 1. It's a famous formula. If we differentiate this again, we get the second derivative. We just take a as it is. And we should differentiate here. So it becomes a minus 1x to the a minus 2. Sounds good. If you repeat this, the nth derivative of x to the a is a times a minus 1 all the way up to a minus n plus 1 times x to the a minus n. Yes. I see. This result can be expressed like this using factorials. Exactly. This transformation is difficult at first glance, but if you write the factorials in detail, you can see how the denominator cancels out part of the numerator like this. That's nice. Now that you've expressed the nth derivative with n, Sundaman, did you get any hints? About the half derivative? Ah, yeah. The half derivative, that is, the one half derivative. I got an idea. If we replace n in the nth derivative with one half, will it become the half derivative? What a great idea. Yeah. But if you try to forcibly replace n with one half in this formula, this will no longer be an integer. You shouldn't do that. That's true. Normally factorials are defined only for non-negative integers, so we need to generalize factorials. Generalize? Yes, we should extend the concept of factorial to include values other than integers. Can we do that? Of course we can. There is something called the gamma function, which is a generalization of factorials. The gamma function is defined as an integral with an infinite interval. Since it is an integral with respect to t, it only depends on x. It is a difficult expression. Yeah, so it is enough to understand, there is a function that generalizes factorials for now. Got it? 
This time we will consider real numbers x greater than 0, but in fact it can be extended to complex numbers. By the way the graph of y equals gamma of x looks like this. An amazing shape. Yeah, it's interesting. Now let's take a look at the properties of the gamma function. We won't prove them, but these equalities hold. Ah, okay. The first equality states that, if you subtract 1 from the inside number, the number will come to the front. You're right. In fact, when you combine it with the second equality, you can see that the gamma function is a generalization of factorials. Try calculating gamma of n plus 1 for non-negative integer n. Well, if you subtract 1 from the inside number, it will come to the front. That's true. And if you subtract again, the inside number will come to the front again. Things are going well. If you repeat this, you will finally get gamma of 1 like this. Gamma of 1 equals 1. So only this part remains. In other words, this is the factorial of n. It's beautiful. Therefore, gamma of n plus 1 equals n factorial holds. Thank you, Zindaman. Although it is off by 1, it's the factorial for non-negative integers. And now, since the gamma function is defined for positive real numbers, we can certainly call it a generalization of factorials. Now let's go back. We proved that the nth derivative of x to the a can be written like this. Then we can rewrite the factorials using the gamma function. Note that if you rewrite them using the gamma function, the numbers will shift by 1, so the factorial of a will be gamma of a plus 1, and the factorial of a minus n will be gamma of a minus n plus 1. Here, we will replace n in the nth derivative with 1 half. Since the gamma function is defined for positive real numbers, we can try substituting 1 half for n here. Okay, I'll try it. First of all, if we forcibly substitute 1 half for n here, I'll write it like this for now. Yeah, the square root represents the 1 half power. Next, we forcibly substitute 1 half for n here and here, and it becomes like this. I see, that's interesting. If you can think of the half derivative of x to the a, it might have the form like this. When we take the half derivative, the exponent decreases by 1 half, and the coefficient can be expressed by the gamma function, simply. Excellent. From here on, the exponent of x is not necessarily an integer. So we will assume that x is positive. The range of the variables is a bit tricky this time. Well then, we should confirm that this is a half derivative. That is if you apply it twice, you will get the same result as differentiation. Sundaman, can you do it? Let's do it. We just thought that the half derivative of x to the a has this form. So let's half differentiate the result once again. Now, assume that we can bring forward the coefficient just like usual differentiation. Then do another half differentiation. So far we think the exponent a of x is a natural number, but I'm going to forcibly apply this formula. Well, first of all we take the coefficient as it is. Then substitute a minus 1 half for a in the half derivative formula, and we get something like this. I see, I understand. Now, 1 half has appeared in the numerator. Okay. Well, these will disappear. So the expression will look like this. Here we will use the property of the gamma function. If we subtract 1 from the inside number, it will come to the front. Therefore, the result is ax to the a minus 1, which corresponds to d by dx x to the a. That is, the result of differentiating x to the a. That's great, Zindaman. Thank you. Now we know that if we apply half differentiation twice, we can get the same result as differentiation. It's quite a shocking formula. Yeah, it means this result. I understand how you feel, but here we're only targeting x to the a. Anyway, I'm relieved to know that this is exactly the half derivative. Well, yeah, it seems to have some meaning. Additionally, let's calculate this coefficient in detail. Is it possible? It's difficult if we think of a as a real number. But as a natural number, we can proceed further. Now, with m as a natural number, we will express the half derivative without using the gamma function. Using the properties of the gamma function, the numerator can be written like this. Since gamma of 1 is 1, the numerator is the factorial of m. Yes. And the denominator looks like this. We go down to 1 half, and gamma of 1 half is left. 
Here let's multiply both the numerator and the denominator by 2, m times. In other words, we will multiply each factor by 2. So the numerator will look like this. Hmm. Yes. And the denominator will be like this. Oh. Did you feel something? What is the square root of pi? Ah, uh, this is the calculation result for gamma of 1 half. But the proof is difficult, so I'll omit it. I'm wondering where pi comes from? If you're curious, please look it up. You mean you won't explain it? Okay. Here this expression can be written simply like this, where this symbol represents the double factorial, which means the factorial skipping one step. This is the formula for the half derivative of x to the m without the gamma function. It is strange that pi is included in the result. To summarize so far, we thought the half derivative of x to the a looks like this. If you repeat it twice, it becomes the derivative. Today we thought a as a positive integer or half integer, but ah, a half integer is a number that deviates from an integer by one half. Looking back on today's discussion, it seems like we can extend a to a real number, paying attention to the domain of the gamma function. It's true. Furthermore, when the exponent of x is a natural number, the half derivative can be expressed like this. On the other hand, when the exponent is a half integer, this result can be obtained by a similar calculation. We need to consider two cases when the exponent of x is an integer or a half integer. In that respect, this formula may be cleaner as it is represented with one expression. Hmm, they have both merits and demerits. Also as a bonus at the end, I made a graph of a half derivative as an example. The blue curve is y equals x squared. The orange is the half derivative. And the green is the derivative. Oh, this is... The half derivative has a shake somewhere between the function and its derivative. Looking at the graph, it really looks like the half derivative. Well, today we've talked about something unknown called half derivatives, using an introductory approach applied to powers of x. This is an important example, because polynomials can approximate various functions, but if you want to learn more in depth, please check out the field of fractional calculus. It's a field with an interesting name. Um, I'm about to head home. Thank you for your hard work. Well then, take care everyone. See you again.